Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 8th, 2018, and my guest is political economist and author Michael Munger of Duke University. This is his 35th, count them, 35, 35th appearance on Econ Talk, which represents about 5% of all Econ Talk episodes. We last heard from him in April of 2018 discussing the economics of traffic. His latest book is Tomorrow 3.0, Transaction Costs and the Sharing Economy, which is our subject for today. Mike, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's a pleasure. Tomorrow 3.0 is a short book, uh, which is a plus in, in my mind. And it, <laughs> but despite its length, its shortness, it packs a lot of intuitive of a lot of intuitive economics into its pages. In a, in a way, uh, while I was reading, I felt like I was uh, reading Munger on Econ Talk's greatest hits. <laughs> There's stuff on middlemen, transaction costs, the sharing economy, property rights, price gouging, universal basic income, division of labor, and more. So if you're a fan of Mike's from this podcast, I think you'll like the book a lot, and you'll learn a lot even if you're not a fan. But who isn't a fan of Mike Munger? You want to try to answer that? That's our first question. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I hear know. from a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what got you to write this book? Uh, you're being sort of snidely modest by saying it sounds like Econ Talk's greatest hits, at least greatest Munger hits. You're absolutely right. Econ Talk caused this book, and it started. Uh, I started thinking about writing it when I did a podcast with you on the sharing economy, and realized that I understood almost none of it. And then it turns out that much of what this book tries to weave together is my attempt over a period of years to try to understand that. And in some ways, it comes from talks that I've given that try to understand different parts of it. And I appreciate the fact that you recognize that it's a relatively short book. It's a book, after all, about, in some ways, about transactions costs. And after I was finished with the book, I thought, you know, I bet I can shorten this by 40%. So I went back through it and spent three months doing nothing but trying to shorten every sentence, every paragraph, because I'm reducing the transactions cost of conveying these ideas there to the reader. That's right. So it really was my objective was to try to make it short. And yet still, when you read it, you think, huh, well, that, that's interesting. It's only 153 pages. And uh, I, I love when people say, oh, this book's overpriced. It's only – it's like yeah. uh, wisdom? You're, you're complaining about the price of wisdom? Seriously. I've literally had people complain about the dollars per page. That's yeah. too many dollars per page. Yeah, I don't understand that exactly, but okay. Uh, let's start with an example you use, which uh, I think has a lot of uh, a lot of value, which is I'm standing in front of a wall in my house. I need to make a hole. I need to drill something, and uh, I actually – I have owned a drill in the past. I'm not, I, can't, I can't say I own one now. But of course, everyone out there listening, some of them have drills, some of them don't. And uh, if you're in that situation, uh, what do you do now? So many of the things that are important consumer durables we own because we want to have immediate low-cost access to their services. So that's true of most tools. Most of the time, most of us, if we're professors or work in some white-collar job or most jobs, you don't constantly use your tools unless you're a contractor. And yet, somewhere in your garage or your storage, you have quite a few tools. So I'm standing in front of a wall. My wife has said, we're going to put up some pictures. I want to drill a hole in the drywall so I can put an anchor in so it won't tear within a couple of weeks. And I could go and buy a drill. I could rent a drill. But what I do is go to my garage and get one of the four power drills that I'm embarrassed to admit that I have and then drill a hole. And then she looks at it and says, no, not that wall. That's not the right one. So I fill in that one and then I go and I drill a different hole. But still, I use the drill for maybe 30 seconds and then I put it back up. The question is, why is it that we own so many things? And the Austrian economics insight is that Almost any consumer durable, your car, a suit that you have in the closet, 
what those actually are is not something you're going to use, like an apple, where you eat it and it's gone. It is a stream of services that extend out into the future. So you have to think about the value of time and you have to think about the value of uncertainty. Now, it turns out that power drills are particularly interesting because they've become a kind of trope of this sharing economy literature. There are 110 million power drills in the United States. That's if you seems rank like those, plenty. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, we have 330 million people, but there's a bunch of idiots like me that have four. And there's quite a few people that, that have none, but a lot of people have at least one power drill. If you take the 110 million and rank them from the most used to the least used and then look at the median, it has been estimated that the 55th millionth power drill ranked by lifetime lifetime use is between 30 and 40 minutes. Because using a power drill for 30 minutes, if you're a contractor, isn't much. But if I'm drilling two holes to put up a picture in the house, I use it for 30 or 40 seconds and then I put it away. So... Why is it that we store these things that we only use for 30 minutes over their entire lifetime? And I claim that it's at least possible to think of an alternative where instead of owning it, I share it. And I share it in a particular kind of way that economists call renting. Because renting is just a way of sharing things with people that you don't know with one residual claimant that takes care of all of the transactions costs. So there's one person at the middle that owns the drill, and that's the nexus of all contracts. And they, they oversee the sharing process and make sure that it's returned in good order and that it's delivered and that's available uh, and that people actually pay for it. And for that service, they take of a profit that is the excess of the price that they get over the cost of providing that rental service. So I pull out my cell phone and I go to Uber and I scroll down to power tools and I, sc I scroll down to drills and then I just press order and the software knows which drill I want. Because this is the future you're talking about. This, now. Is, this is the future. Now, some people say I'm going a bit too far. That was a drill. Gar, gar, gar. Knee slapper. Knee slapper. Yeah. Uh, but well, I'm, I'm picking something that's literally a bit too far because it is in the future. It's a bit implausible. So I keep going. Press, I press order, and somewhere I don't know where, an Uber autonomous car with no driver picks up a power drill from maybe it's an owner, maybe it's a contractor who's not using it, who's put it outside in a smart pod. Maybe it's a, a rental company that does this for a living. Uh, but the, the Uber car picks up the drill. It has a bunch of deliveries to make. So it solves, the software solves the traveling salesman problem that is making the set of deliveries and the minimum total distance in time. And in a few minutes, my phone buzzes because I have a smart pod in front of my house. The drill has been delivered. I go and I open up the smart pod with the security code that's in my phone, and it takes no time. I just open it up. I, I, I make the holes in the wall. My wife says, no, no, not that wall. And I think, Nyay! okay, I'll do it in a different wall. And then I put the drill back. I've had it for about five minutes. It cost me a total of $2 and almost no cost. The pod is smart. It knows the drill has been put back in it. It, the software, calls another Uber car that picks up that drill and then takes it to its next use. No human beings are involved in the allocation or transfer of this rental product among all of the different users. And it's a commercial quality power drill that's better than I would have purchased. So it's a better drill than I would have had access to. The result is that instead of having 110 million yeah, adequate power drills. We have something like 10 or 12 million power drills at any given time. They're high quality commercial power drills. They're extremely intensively used and maybe they get used up in a year or two, but then we make some more. The point is that the prices from being able to rent instead of own means that we're saving on the opportunity cost of the money that's tied up in the drill and in the storage costs. Because when it comes to consumer durables, you pay for them twice. First, you pay for the cost of the thing, and then you pay for the safe and secure storage of the thing so that it's available. Your closets are full of stuff. Your kitchen cabinets are full of stuff. I have, I'm embarrassed to admit, a sausage maker. I've used it twice. <laughs> it's, it's huge and heavy. Why in the world do I have those things? Well, it's because the, the, the software 
world that I just talked about hasn't yet solved the transactions cost problem in a way that makes it possible. I want to mention a couple of other factors, which that story neglects. Um, one is, in my case, I have a couple of friends who own every tool, every single one. They they have every tool for reasons that are in, somewhat inexplicable, but they tend to do more home improvement than I do. So I can borrow tools from them at no charge other than that I owe them emotionally. That's one now, factor. Why, why, why is that? Why do I owe them emotionally or why do they own so many tools? <laughs> Why do they let you borrow it at zero cost? Because we're friends. We're friends. Oh, but they could be renting it out. They Suppose could be. that there's a platform. No, I agree. I just, so I'm, in, just, I'm just I'm just there is a fourth possibility here or a third possibility of, of, of literally sharing. As long uh, as there's no rental market. Correct. But even if there was, they might decide to let me use it for, for, for without paying for it. They yes. might give me a bargain. Uh, but the, the other the, – and I'm, they're actually that, – that market – the true sharing, a lot of people don't like the phrase sharing economy to describe, say, Uber or Airbnb is because they don't really share, they charge. Uh, but put that to the side, I'll come back, I'll, I'll come back to it. The, the other thing is that some people do enjoy having the physical tools. They like looking at them. They like, you know, it's just a thing. Just, but that just, I just mentioned that as an aside. But my well, real- I mean, I was going to, I was going to come back to that at the very end. Let's do it now for just 30, yeah, or 30 seconds or so. I think the most interesting kind of sharing is the kind that doesn't involve markets at all. So I started out with this very pedestrian rental transaction. I think one of the things, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that platforms make possible. Platforms are an integrated software, hardware package that facilitate these things. Platforms make true sharing possible. And so there's this turnkey open source software called a tool library. And you can borrow from your friends because they know you and trust you. But suppose that entrance to a tool library was just you own one or two tools that you agree to make available to other people when you're not using them. Well, that means that in effect, everybody, all the 30 people in the tool library have a whole bunch of tools at their access. So Adam Smith said that markets are limited by the extent Forgive me, division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Well, this kind of sharing is only limited by the size of the cooperation horizon that's defined by the platform. And so you can borrow from your friends, but you might be able to borrow from your neighbor that you don't know very well. In order to borrow tools, they need to be pretty close together. Software can handle this sharing problem in a way that opens a whole new world of actual sharing. So the point that you just made, I, I sort of tried to push it away. I think that's actually the place that, that we should end up, and maybe we'll talk about it more then. But as usual, you have anticipated what I think is really the most interesting question, and that is, is true sharing possible? We needn't fetishize markets and these complicated rental agreements. True sharing is possible, so it could be a whole new world. Yeah, and obviously the the cost of acquiring the object is part of the part of this question of whether you should share or charge, share or rent. Um, but if suppose I really like tools, but I have software that makes me pretty sure that it'll be returned if I loan it out or rent it out, then there'll be even more people who have a bunch of tools because they like them. Because they can rent them out and, and share them out, reducing the cost to them of possessing it. Yep. So the, uh, people are going to specialize. Some people are going to be owners. Some people are going to be borrowers and sharers. And it doesn't even it doesn't have to follow the contours of what we now think of as market exchanges. So way to go. Well, when I was younger, I had a rule, which was to never lend out any of my books. And the reason I never lent them out is I noticed how often they didn't come back. Yeah, um, and it, even with good friends, and it wasn't uh, just an empirical observation I made that when I tended to lend out a book, two things happened: I forgot who I lent it to, <laughs> and they forgot that they had borrowed it, so yeah. they never saw them again. And I think about a book I wanted to read or look at or leaf through, and I go look for it, and I get really frustrated because I couldn't find it. And then I was, oh yeah, I probably lent it to somebody. And one way people solved that is they put their names in their books and they treat it like a they put a little card in there or they, they create some system. That's a big transaction cost, by the way, which yeah. I never got to. And eventually I changed my pro- – I did a 180. I lend out all my books now, and I assume I'm not getting them back. And when I lend out a book, I just go buy it again And uh-huh. if, if, I, if I care about it. There are a few books I've lent out I don't care about, and I'm happy to see them reduce my storage costs. But 
often I love them, and that's why I'm lending them. I'm telling you, this is a great book. You should read it. Now I just said that was a that's a wonderful thing that I can give that away, and I can get a book. You know, I can get on get a used copy for under ten dollars often of, of any any almost any book. And so now to me, that's just a I love that gift aspect of of book lending, and um, that's made my that that decision's really helped me. But with a power tool, it's not such an easy. Right. And of course, yes. by the way, I have, I have tools in my house right now that I'm pretty sure came from uh, handy handymen and contractors who just left them here. Like yeah. I have, I have a really nice drill. I don't know whose it is. That person, <laughs> it's a shame. You know, it's, I feel I'm embarrassed okay. about it. I didn't notice it for, you know, three years. All of a sudden, I'm in my basement and I say, I wonder what that is. Oh, it's not mine. I don't know what to do about it. Occasionally, I've, or, you know, I have a fairly regular handyman. I'll say, is this yours? Sometimes he takes it. He says, no, it's not mine. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so, of course, you asked about anticipating questions. My question about the drill is, why don't we have that already? And and I want you to talk about the different kinds of transaction costs and how that creates a set of limits on potentially on what – can be shared and what can't be or what is unlikely to be shared because it doesn't work economically. It'll take a little while to kind of get to the basics of the answer and then we can circle back. So I think you've probably heard this story, but it is worth repeating because it was a big event in my life. When I was in graduate school, one of my dissertation advisors was Douglas North and at my dissertation defense uh, in 1984, Doug asked a question, and your dissertation defense is pretty scary because, you know, if you don't pass, that would be terrible. So I was worried, and I did what economists do when they have a question, the answer to which they don't know. I went to the board and started drawing equations. <laughs> Finally, after about two excruciating minutes of silence, Doug North raised his hand, and he said in a voice that you might use to address a uh, not very bright but well-loved child, Michael. The answer is transaction costs. The only answer I was looking for was transaction costs. And I later realized that it didn't matter what the question was for Doug North. The answer was transaction costs. It's the answer to every question. But then it took more years after that for me to realize that he was absolutely right. If you start out by thinking in terms of what are the transaction costs here, you'll make a, it's a good way to, to start to break down what the answer should be. So um, – one of the people who first started working on the economics of transaction costs was Ronald Coase. And it's interesting, Coase was pretty careful never really to give a clear definition of transaction costs because he thought that transactions costs are conditional on the particular kinds of institutions, liability arrangements, and legal process in which it's embedded. So you can talk about transaction costs, but specifically defining them with a bunch of different categories, he thought wasn't a very good idea. I think it's useful because it's a, a way of, un, of breaking down the problem a little bit. So I think the three categories of transaction costs are first triangulation. The people who want to cooperate or buy and sell have to be able to find each other, and they have to be able to identify each other as, as possessing something that the other wants. Usually in economics, we start with this idea that A has a widget, B has some money and wants a widget, and then they negotiate on price. Well, how did they meet? How do they know that they have a widget? Do they speak the same language? Do they have a currency that they can use to consummate the exchange? There's a bunch of things that have to happen before you get to the, and then there's a price part. So triangulation involves that. The second is transfer. Transfer is we actually deliver the product. We actually make the payment. We clear the transaction in a way that both parties agree with. And a, that's a big part of any transaction. Third is trust. That is, I know that you're not going to rob me. You're, I'm not going to rob you. And we recognize that the thing that's being sold and the thing that's being used to purchase it actually are those things. There's no fraud. So anything that solves all three of those problems, I want to call a platform. And platforms date way back in history. One of the first platforms was what we now call the souk, the bazaar. And when you think about it, it's kind of odd that these very large markets grew up why would it be – suppose you have three you, – you've worked for a year. You have three bags of wheat. That is the product of your farm. You don't have much of a farm because it's not automated. This is 4000 BC, and you're thinking of going to the souk in Ur. 
Now, why I think would it's you? Ur. Do- ur. All right. Ur. I mean, it's Ur. <laughs> and seriously, for listeners who who don't speak <laughs> Middle Eastern, it's I, I, you're talking about U R, right? Not, I, I, yeah. I am talking about U R. A town. Yeah. It, it was a decent sized city in um, Samaria, and. It near it was between the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates, and it's one of the oldest cities on Earth, and that's why I'll pronounce it right this time. If something is a very old book, we call it an Ur text. Yeah. That it is the is something that that's very old. So suppose I have three bags of grain in Ur. Well, but I'm 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 ten miles outside of town. Why don't I just go to the middle of a field and sell it? Why would I transport it all the way to a place where a bunch of other people are trying to sell their grain? That seems like I'm going to lose because of the competition. So I have to transport it, and then there's all these competitors. Why don't I go to the middle of a field and sell it there? And the answer is I'm going to be in that field a while. (laughs) Nobody knows that I'm there with my three bags of grain. And what they're trying to do is put together a caravan to go north. Nobody is going to pay the transport costs. So I pay the transport costs, and I go to a place where there's a settled price. So at the souk, and it, it, S-O-U-K, S-O-U-Q, depending on how uh, – it, it, it's transliteration from Arabic, meaning a place or market. So at the souk, there's a platform. It sense that we can find each other. We can agree on a price because there's many buyers and many sellers. There's – a way to deliver because I can I know to bring it there it reduces the transactions cost of knowing where to take it there's a bunch of camels waiting to move it somewhere else and we trust each other because we're providing security just along the roads and in this concentrated area so we have those three things all at once and that's why people would go to a souk and not to somewhere else so those kind of market arrangements those things existed for thousands of years One of the next examples of a platform that's really still quite old, but I think interesting, comes from what I think is the single best podcast that you have done on all of Econ Talk. And it was the 13th one that you did in August of 2006 with a guy named Chris Anderson of Wired. And we're talking about a book of his called The Long Tail. And in that podcast, he talks about the Sears catalog. And I listened to the podcast again yesterday, kind of just by accident, and I realized that the Sears catalog is a platform. Yeah. Sears was not selling stuff. Their job was not to sell stuff. What they were selling was reductions in transactions costs. So some of the stuff in the Sears catalog – because so you, you live in a little town on in southern Illinois. There's a railroad that goes by now and then, but it doesn't stop. And the only place you can buy stuff is you can go to the dry goods store or maybe there's kind of a hardware store and they have a couple dozen items. That's the extent of the market. That's the cooperation horizon in your world. Not much specialization is possible. Not much division of labor is possible. Is there a way to deliver access that's your discretion to the wide world of division of labor? Well, yes, because twice a year, this enormous 600-page book arrives in your mailbox from Sears. It's abs- and, and the print is really small. There's thousands and thousands of products that are available. Some of them are made by Sears. A few more are purchased under contract from Sears, but a lot of them are just third-party items that Sears gives space to in its paper souk. So I can find – I can solve the triangulation problem because I can find stuff that's available. I didn't even know it existed, but I want it. I need that for my farm. I need that because that clothing is much more beautiful than anything that a local seamstress or tailor can provide me. Well, what about transfer? Sears specialized in reducing the costs of delivery and payment. Much of what Sears did was provide credit to people that had problems annually of coming up with enough money at the right time. So they would Sears would loan out money and then they would process the payment. So the seller gets paid. Sears would wait until the buyer could make the payment. So they were the intermediary on all these payments. And for trust, they would give an implicit guarantee. 
So if the product didn't work, they would refund it. If it arrived broken, Sears would take care of it. What that meant was that Sears, the Sears catalog and the, the services behind it are a self-contained platform. Now, a number of other of those have happened since, and you, you, we maybe can talk about some other examples, but let's get to the, the, the drill. You may remember that there was a company called Amazon that sold pretty much just one product, yep. books. Amazon sold books. And it's actually pretty remarkable now because you can still buy books from Amazon, but Amazon is the Sears catalog of the 21st century because – Almost everything that Amazon sells is manufactured by someone else. Amazon makes most of its money from the software called Amazon Web Services, which is a platform. I can find the product. I can identify price. I can search across different sellers very easily because Amazon's set up for these searches. I can arrange the payments because I'm actually paying Amazon and then Amazon pays the seller. So Amazon as an intermediary is protecting me Takes from credit risk. card fraud. And Amazon has a truly remarkable delivery system. And in fact, this morning, uh, I got an Amazon delivery. It wasn't an Amazon truck. It was a rental U-Haul truck that pulled up in front of my house and brought me a box, which I had ordered on Saturday. I ordered something on Saturday. It was delivered to me today. It was a big, heavy box of dog food. And this was in a rental truck. Amazon doesn't actually own this. They're renting all of the things that they need to provide this delivery service. But Amazon's ability to deliver is remarkable. It's really unbelievable. So the three things that come together there, triangulation, transfer, and trust, make Amazon a platform. On that platform, you can buy an amazing different array of stuff. Why not drills? Well, the answer is that Amazon's set up for ownership. It's not really set up set up for sharing or rental. Yeah, you can There's buy a nothing. drill. You can buy a drill. Why can't the you, can why can't you rent one? And have it delivered. The question is, why not? You asked about my scenario. Yeah. Why isn't that possible? My scenario is something more like um, – renting. And then you suggested rightly that there's other kinds of sharing. And those things are also not really possible yet. So why not? Well, the answer, I think, is that we're on the verge of a new platform that's going to solve a lot of those problems. So Amazon used to sell books. We've forgotten about that. Ten years from now, we're going to say, you know, Uber used to be a taxi company. We will have forgotten about that because Uber is a platform. Uber can solve the problems of triangulation, transfer, and trust for almost any product. The thing that's great is that Uber is actually set up for delivery of people. Maybe they're going to provide some kind of service. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's a drill that I then want to, to take back. Now, Uber at this point is still what Amazon was when they were just selling books. But Uber soon will be able to start delivering all sorts of other things that are not just human beings. They'll be able to deliver products, uh, services. What that means is that the big battle is not really between Uber and the taxi companies. The big battle is between something like Uber and something like Amazon for primacy. Now, why would you say – why would I say that there's – Primacy is important. And part of the reason is that trust is a network economy. One of the things that Amazon has that gives it a big lead is an inventory of reviews. So when I go on Amazon, I can find hundreds of reviews of almost every product I want to look at. Anybody else who wants to enter this market, someone has to make up the shortfall that you have at the beginning. You don't have reviews of all these products. It's the trust so, part. Uber has a chance of overcoming this. The reason it hasn't happened yet is that Uber is not yet moved into rental markets and that barrier to entry on the trust part, which is absolutely crucial. So just a footnote on your your U-Haul um, rental. My, my impression is that Amazon doesn't, doesn't have drivers. They just – they outsource that also. I think what you saw was probably an individual well put. Who, who delivers for lots yeah. of people and happens to have rented a – you all truck for him or herself. Yeah. Uh, I see people pull up in front of my house in cars. Yeah. It, I'm slightly surprised. I mean, who's visiting me at at ten at night or two in the at seven in the morning? And it's somebody delivering an Amazon package. They don't have a uniform on. They yeah, don't no, look like a UPS they're, driver. They're in their they're, they're renting the people too. You're yeah. right. They're renting the people so too. That's just that's just footnote number one. I think the other question is, yeah, and I 
you didn't you said a lot of really interesting things just there, but you didn't answer the piece of the question that that I'd like you to get to, which is there are certain natural limits. So of of even if Uber solves the autonomous car problem or somebody does, um, I'm willing to wait. I might be willing to wait a half an hour to get the drill to draw to drill the hole. I don't know if I'm ever gonna if I'm ever going to uh, borrow somebody else's jeans. Which clothing is another example that you mentioned in the book, um, or just to take an even sillier example, I'm probably going to own my own silverware because even though I could rent silverware for when I'm about to eat, the the transaction costs of that, even though the app is seamless and fabulous and quick, I really don't even want to walk out to the to the curb because the price savings on the silverware use is just so small that that time cost is going to actually be large enough to keep me from doing it. So talk about some of the ways those factors interact. Those are both really good questions. Um, so I think that the this sharing, I'm more confident now about calling it the sharing revolution because I think that my earlier claims about rental are pretty short-sighted, that we'll think of better ways to do it than the sort of formal renting, but sticking with formal renting, there are many kinds of, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to make a sort of Coasean point. Coase asked this really great question in 1937. If markets are so great, why are there firms? And his answer was, Haha, this will sound familiar, transaction costs. Yeah, explain the question first, though. Because that well, most people would say, well, what, what kind of a question is that? We've talked about it before. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, e- economists brag about the ability of prices to organize decentralized, uh, distributed a- uh, activities, transactions among people that don't know each other. So Friedrich Hayek in 1945 gives the example of tin. If the price of tin goes up, I don't need to know why. I just know that I need to economize. People who produce tin don't need don't need to know why. They'll just try to make more tin. Entrepreneurs don't need to know why. They'll just figure out a way to make substitutes. So the price system directs people to do what they would do if they had perfect information. And that's a great saving. So prices are really wonderful. Prices organize the economic system. Coase said, well, if prices are so great, why are these are these little command economies that we call firms embedded in them? Because if I work for Ford Motor Company, I don't put a bolt into the chassis of the Ford car and then go on eBay and auction it off and find the highest price, deliver it to them, and then they put on the fender. Instead, the next guy in the line just puts on the fender. Price is not operating here. I'm being ordered to it's do this by around. an entrepreneur. That's the And w- most people, when you ask, who tells you what to do? They don't say prices. They say, my boss. Yeah. So bosses do a lot more ordering around than prices. Kosa's question was, where is the margin? And firms call this the make or buy decision. So firms make some things, but they buy other things. So maybe for a while, Ford Motor Company considered going out and making its own steel for cars, but they never grew the wheat for the sandwiches in the employee cafeteria. They always bought something. So that line between make or buy, Coase claimed, was based on transactions cost. It was the cost of using the market versus the cost of organizing this transaction within the company. Well, the point of, if I I say in the book, I think that if Coase were alive today, he might ask a question why is it that we own instead of share? And the answer is still transactions cost. The margin between owning and sharing will be determined by transactions cost. The thing is that Coase recognized that there was a dynamic component to this. That is the size of firms, both in terms of the scope of products and the amount of products that they produce, will be determined over time by transaction cost. If it's cheaper to buy things in the market, then firms will shrink. Well, the endogenous thing about sharing, and I think this is possibly worrisome, is that there will be a greater and greater gap between urban and rural people. So people who live in cities 
are going to be able to participate in the sharing economy. You said you don't want to wait 30 minutes. If you live in a large city and there are these Uber robots that are going around delivering things and they can go along the street and they can also go up the elevator, it might only be four or five minutes before it's delivered because the density of transactions is so high in a city. But that means that people who live not in a city are going to find themselves facing much higher costs to participating in the sharing economy either because they can borrow it from their neighbor in a tool library or it's delivered by an Uber robot from someplace that they've rented. So the transactions cost is going to drive more than just which products are shared and which products are owned. Over time, if that claim is right, it's, all, it's actually going to drive the structure of communities, meaning that people, just like in the Industrial Revolution, are going to move from rural areas to urban areas. And the question is, how can we think about that in a way that makes it possible? The advantage is you'll need far less storage. You won't need parking spaces. You won't need much closet space. And yes, you're not going to borrow jeans, but or there's underwear. a company called – Well, the, the example that I use in the book is toothbrush. I am an assiduous brusher of teeth. I don't brush other people's teeth. It's not creepy. <laughs> I just brush my own teeth. But I brush my teeth two minutes in the morning, two minutes in the evening. So for 23 hours and 56 minutes, my toothbrush hangs there unused. It is hard to imagine any way of being able to commodify that excess capacity. Well, you but could commodify it, the handle, which has – if it's an electric toothbrush. The transaction costs are too high. Yeah. You, you, you could share the handle, and in fact, it's set up for that in, you know, for families because you have sep different separate that, – that's a good point. It is set up for sharing. But – there are some products that it's unlikely transactions cost would ever fall enough that we would share them. But if transactions cost fall, the thing is that entrepreneurs, any problem that you and I can think of is a problem that some entrepreneur is working to solve because they can solve this problem. They can, they can make money. They can make profits. By a, anything that looks like a problem is actually a profit opportunity. So there's a company, and this is my favorite example of the sharing economy, called Blah Blah Car. And I usually ask if I'm giving a talk on this subject, I'll ask a young woman in the audience, ma'am, do you hitchhike? And of course, the answer is always no. And I've already told them that the answer to every question is transaction costs. But OK, I ask, why don't you hitchhike? Because she looks horrified and they, you know, that would be creepy. It's too dangerous. No, the answer is just transactions costs. Suppose that you had an app and that in Europe it's called Blah Blah Car where an awful lot of people end up hitchhiking. So all the trucks that go on the interstate between the large cities, many cars, they just have one passenger. If you could commodify that excess capacity and solve the three transactions cost problem, triangulation, transfer, and trust, you could have hitchhiking. And so Blah Blah Car, the, the app, provides four pieces of information. The first is, where are you now? Second is, where do you want to go? The third is, at what time do you want to go? And the fourth is, how much do you want to talk? So blah means, I really don't like other people very much. Blah, blah means enjoys a natter. Blah, blah, blah means rarely pauses even for breath. <laughs> so you, you can go from where you are to where you want to go using a completely unused seat that would otherwise be empty at the time you want to go and have a conversational partner that is interesting. The reviews that are available mean that both the writer and the driver can evaluate each other. So I love that. One of the reasons I love that, um, first of all, I just want to make a point about the toothbrush. Again, it's not just that it, the transaction costs are too high. It also is the factor that a toothbrush is relatively inexpensive. So you always want to compare – the cost of ownership to the to the benefits of renting. And in the case of the toothbrush, since it's a relatively inexpensive thing, again, I don't really want to trot out to the smart pod on my – at the uh, mailbox, say, and pick up my handle for my toothbrush and then shove my brush part into the handle and then go back down to the pod and all that. So that's the first thought I had. Second, second thought point I want to make is that you're really imagining – and you, you basically said this. I just want to restate it in a different way. Uh, we could have a smart apartment building where the whole – building and maybe the whole city, but certainly to start with the building is designed for this kind of reduction in transaction costs where the delivery part would be much more seamless than it is in a rural area or even in a suburb or even in some cities. So that's that's um, that's very interesting. But I also want to comment – the blah, blah 
car is really a fantastic thing because uh, do they charge? Is it a free thing? <laughs> No, they, they, they charge. Now, there are there there are some companies that try to arrange it, and basically it's like it's a membership. So sometimes you drive, and sometimes you're a rider. But the you do actually pay. But it, for blah blah car, suppose I'm in Brno and I want to go to Prague, it's a, the equivalent of a hundred dollars to go on the train. It's ten or twelve dollars to go on blah blah car. So it's dramatically cheaper. And the driver is getting some of the benef- some of that profit, I assume, not just the platform. Right, but the driver's also getting companies. No, so no, it could be you pay. It could be you have to pay to be a driver because they want the company, right? It's not yeah. obvious which way the payment is going to go. Well, I, I think the, the, the driver gets some uh, – uh, the driver, the owner of the vehicle gets some of it. Blah, blah, car takes a small bit, but the the – since many people would just as soon have company, particularly company that's compatible, the cost is driven down. The part I really like is that there have been a couple times in my life where – Instead of renting a car on a trip, more than a couple, uh, I, I don't rent a car. I just use Uber. And But on some of those trips, I've had to take a lot of trips. It still might be worth it to me to take Uber. But on a day where I've had four or five Uber rides, um, sometimes I'm just talked out. And I always I, – I struggle sometimes when I get an Uber because I sometimes say to the driver, I'm really tired. I apologize. I'm just going to rest. And I feel like I have let them down in certain circumstances. Of course, some Uber drivers don't want to hear me talk. Maybe all of them, actually. <laughs> uh, but in general, I know there are some Uber drivers. The reason they are driving Uber is partly for the money, but partly for to meet people, literally, to yeah. just chat and to have an interesting day. A lot yeah. of Uber drivers I've met are retired, and they literally enjoy – one of the reasons they're driving is they enjoy meeting new people. And that's part of obviously what blah blah car is. But what I love is you get to set it in advance. Yeah, that's they, they just recognize the, that is that. a brilliant idea. I love that. It's so well, fantastic. It's so important that it's part of the name. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the other aspect of this, though, which is I think uh, interesting on this uh, question of, of monetary aspect of true sharing versus semi whatever you want to call it rental, more like rental, is couch surfing. So couch surfing is this again in a different generation. People who are older find this bizarre, but younger people find it normal. Um, you rent out your couch, but you don't rent it out. You share your couch, and you say, "I'm going to let anybody stay in my house." You can put different, you know, gender preferences and other things on the on the app, but I'm going to let people come spend the night in my house on the couch. There's no charge. Uh, my son recently was on the floor in a couch surfing experience. Uh, so it's not literally a couch, but it's basically different ways to spend the night under a roof. But there's no money exchange. There's sometimes evidently there's a gift expected. Uh, my son said he brought a six pack of a beer as a thank you, and there's also no terminal limit on how many nights you stay. It's sort of it's all up for grabs. Uh, and of course, it's different on different uh, different providers. Of course, choose how many nights they want to limit or whatever. But it's just an extraordinary uh, change. That this platform you're talking about makes possible that couldn't be imagined. The idea of staying in a stranger's house uh, is frightening. Uh, hitchhiking is frightening. Uh, and all of a sudden, it's now normal. And because the app has pr- solved that trust problem, and along with the triangulation and the transfer, and it's just uh, – it's a fascinating thing. I often do ask, and, and I'm sorry to pick on young women, but they're they're less likely to hitchhike. So after you know we've all laughed and said, okay, hitchhiking is possible. I'll ask, do you use Airbnb? And without exception, she has always said, oh yes. So you're willing to stay in somebody else's apartment and know they have the key, but you're not willing to ride in somebody else's car. And the difference is, Airbnb has normalized and other other companies, but Airbnb in particular, has normalized our sense that this is a transaction that the app can handle and that trust, because of these reviews, tells you something about. So the well, it's Airbnb – It's not just the reviews. The fact that if, if, God forbid, something happens to me in that house, male or female, you don't have to be a female to have something horrible happen to you in a stranger's house. Yeah. That still is uh, – the app knows where you are, and that's it, huge. It, you don't it, walk up to a stranger yeah. at Times Square and say, can I place to stay tonight? Yeah. <laughs> It has their financial information, it has their ID. Um, many people, and I've done this as an Airbnb host, I've, I, they, they have a, 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 an image of my passport. Yeah. So you can do quite a bit of background check. So once we've normalized that experience, then yes, we start to think of this as, yeah, it's not a big deal. There's 
You raised the question of couch surfing, though, which is much more like a sort of cooperative sharing activity. So I wanted to bring up the example of a platform that people may not have thought about, and that is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is also a platform. The triangulation problem is that people sort themselves into groups based on their interest and knowledge. And I don't have to go out and find people because Wikipedia has all these different categories. I have the, – the transfer is they have a protocol for I get to make edits and it, I'm invited just to make edits. And then the community decides whether those edits are going to be accepted or not. And in terms of trust, there are reviews. If I'm always a troll, then you can disable my ability to make changes. Now, yes, I can come back and try to make it, but Wikipedia is remarkably consistent in being able to provide the three things that a platform needs in order to have this service, but nobody's getting paid. We only pay with honor and a sense of contributing to the public good. So it's a voluntary contribution to the public good, and it works really well. So I, I think that the, the idea of sharing, if you can reduce the transactions cost of voluntary provision of public goods, then things like Wikipedia may proliferate. And the, the, the idea that there has to be some kind of fee for service may start to disappear. There, there's a way, there are ways of sharing that are based on honor and our sympathy for other people, our desire, if you're, if you're out there playing the drinking game, here it comes, although Russ isn't saying it, but our desire to be lovely. <laughs> we want not just to be loved, but to be lovely. And so the being part of a community that's an expert on some subject that takes care of the Wikipedia entries on that subject means that I have connections with somebody in South Korea, somebody with Europe in Europe that I've never met, but we have this feeling of being part of something larger than ourselves and that is something that software platforms can also advance. So I'm going to take us in a different direction now uh, because I think Hard to believe. I think this is not what I'm going to say next. We haven't talked about uh, – some of what we've talked about today, we've talked about before. We're talking about it in new ways. I always um, – you know, I think you and I could have a conversation every six months on transaction costs, and it, I would learn something every time. So I, it, it is one of those topics like the division of labor, uh, like emergent order that I think is so rich and so challenging to think about and keep everything juggling in your mind at once that – uh, it's very fruitful to talk about it at, at length and in depth. But I, I want to change our focus just a little bit here, which is this idea of platforms that are for profit and platforms that are not. And of course, actually, you, we did an episode on nonprofits that this is somewhat related to, I'm sure. But here's the thing I want to raise. So I mentioned recently on Econ Talk that George Stigler probably would, would say that Wikipedia doesn't exist because obviously it's not going to can't be possible without using money to create a good encyclopedia that would be even possibly decent. Forget about the fact that I think it's probably better than most uh, printed encyclopedias in many dimensions. But I will also say – so he's wrong about that or the, I'm using poor George as a, as a sort of a homo economicus um, – a little bit of a straw man. Yeah, but, those but, that those that knew him would say it's not that much of a straw man. Yeah. He, he's there for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So that was George, and I, but he, but he represents the way a lot of economists look at the world. They don't they assume that people do things for money and they need rewards. Sometimes they're non monetary, but in general, money works really well, and I think that's generally true. So Wikipedia is an extraordinary uh, example of how without money, just honor, just pride, just. Uh, showing off, uh, earning a reputation of various things, returns. People have created something rather extraordinary. Having said that, it's my impression that Wikipedia is a little bit static. It does not – hasn't quite fulfilled the um, promise that it, that it had as it was growing, and it is less dynamic than I thought it would turn out to be. And, and let me suggest a related challenge. So there are a lot of apps out there that, that you and I might use and love. I'm going to pick one that's a big part of my life, which is Evernote. So Evernote, it's an app that I use for just storing all kinds of information on my computer, on my phone. I really like it. It's A, a second example would be Medium. I write at medium.com. I love the platform. It's fantastic. Both of those may disappear uh, at some point. They may, just like um, other 
apps and other websites don't make it in the in the internet economy. So then the question is, what's going to happen to my stuff? And I've always wondered, and I've talked about this before on Econ Talk, but not with you, which is, well, couldn't a foundation then run the app in, in a nonprofit way? Couldn't it maintain? Could a foundation run Uber at some point? Could uh, – is there a return? Is there a benefit from using the, a nonprofit focus – to run a platform. And let me just give one more point and then I'll let you respond, which is you say at the end, toward the end of the book that Uber and Amazon are in competition. Unsurprisingly, surprisingly, Uber's not competing with cab companies. Amazon's not competing with Barnes and Noble anymore. Uh, they're both competing with each other for providing stuff that, in ways that reduce transact, not providing stuff for just reducing transaction costs. I think it's a deep, deep insight. But it seems to me that what's going to happen is that Amazon will acquire Uber or will create their own platform that that solves the the delivery problem in its own with driverless autonomous vehicles. And then there's going to be this giant platform, which will be phenomenally pleasant, but it will have some monopoly power because it probably will kill, if it really fulfills the, all the promise that we think about, it will kill all the brick and mortar stores that act now as something of a restraint on Amazon's profitability. So I just, I wonder about the power and a lot of people are starting to wonder about this, the power of these very broad platforms to provide sometimes information, to provide, in this case, goods and services. How are they going to work in a world that benefits the consumer when competition may not be what it used to be? And one answer is, well, somebody will create an alternative that isn't profit-driven. And then the question is, when I think about Evernote, you know, when we get to, to uh, iOS 24, we're at iOS, say, 12 now on the my phone, we get to iOS 24 – is the foundation that runs Evernote going to be able to work with iOS 24? Because I don't really need Evernote to keep getting better. And that was my point about Wikipedia. I'd like Wikipedia to keep getting better, but it's pretty great as it is. If Evernote stayed the same, didn't add any new features, I'd be fine. But of course, there's tremendous pressure on to add new features because it, it needs to compete and because stock, if it's a public company, I don't even know. They want more money. They bought it at a time when it was already established. So Facebook has to keep finding new, for example, ways to generate money out of its out of its user base. And after a while, I'm thinking maybe this would be better if it weren't profit based. I know that's a radical thing for a hardcore free marketer like me to say, but that's my thought. So that's a lot of rambling and uh, your turn. You asked three gigantic questions, each of which takes a 20 minute answer. I'll see if I oh, can do all of, of it in three or four. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I, the, those, the problem is they're really great questions. So one thing you asked was about motivations that are not profit driven. And one of my favorite Nobel Prize winners in economics and a guest on Econ Talk is Gene Fama. Gene Fama has a series of papers uh, with uh, co-authored with Michael Jensen in the 1970s, early 1980s, where he looks at the nonprofit as a form of financing that is designed to attract capital. Now, that might seem paradoxical, but what nonprofits do, after all, is they're a particular way of arranging financial activity. And so Fama's insight was – there's a lot of nonprofits out there, and a lot of them behave a lot like profit-making companies because they're trying to make revenue, and they're trying to maximize revenue after taking out costs. It's just that they're not equity-financed. The fact that they're not equity-financed means that people are more willing to make contributions. And those contributions may be the impulse that we have to act for the common good. So when you do experiments, it actually turns out that people are willing to make voluntary contributions to public goods. It's not true that markets can't provide these things. Now, for profit, price-driven markets may not be able to provide public goods, but nonprofits are pretty good at providing public goods. A lot of people voluntarily give money or make contributions to the public good. Give blood. So they they – they give contributions to public radio. Uh, they make contributions to the opera, to the zoo, to art museums, to children's museums. There's all sorts of things where we make contributions. <clears throat> now, suppose, yeah, voluntarily, without any coercion at all. Suppose that you were able to write an app that reduced the transactions cost of doing that. And suppose you live in a little community and there's a park. And we've decided that having a public works department is pretty expensive. We're just going to do this voluntarily. So what we have is a an app 
based on something we haven't talked about yet, the blockchain. The blockchain is a distributed ledger that can't be tampered with. And the the part of the blockchain that this app works on is that everybody has glasses. They have wearables. And you can switch these glasses to have a, a, a VR, a uh, virtual reality component. So I, I come up by the park and I see, dang, look at that. The grass is really high. Somebody ought to mow the lawn. So I switch on the VR component and I see that somebody has bid to pay for the mowing of 100 yards over there. I will, I will pay for mowing the grid right ahead of me. And so I take out my phone or whatever tool I have to connect with and I put up a bid that then is available to everybody else. And my name is there. And none of the bids are paid unless everybody has, unless enough people have put in bids to make sure that the park gets mowed. Well, that would reduce the transactions cost of this impulse that we naturally have, and it can't be counterfeited because it's connected to uh, the, the blockchain ledger that makes sure that that payment that I have is now encumbered. It's, in effect, in escrow. As soon as someone says, yes, I'll mow the park because there are a total of $45 worth of bids, the money is transferred to the mower. He does the mowing, and we just have accomplished that whole thing voluntarily. We have that Once now. We have that now with Indiegogo and other crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. Acti- I think it's Indiegogo, but there's others. GoFundMe. Oh, but the, they create the, the, a minimum. It just we haven't gotten the habit yeah. of doing it with public goods. We do it with, you know, designing a new suitcase or a yeah. new kind of smartphone. That's, that, I, I don't think this is that far away. We have the VR and we have this habit already for crowdsourcing. The thing is that economists tend to make this hard line about public goods that they can't be provided by for-profit companies. Well, they don't have to be. We actually have almost all of the tools we would need to solve this problem by a kind of voluntary sharing. Instead of me sharing the tools, I'm sharing the costs, but I'm doing it in a way that really encourages other people also to share. So you ask, what is the future of sharing that's not based on profits? I think I'm not smart enough to understand or predict all of the ways that it could be changed, but I think there's an enormously rich set of connections as long as it's tied to something like the blockchain that solves the trust problem. Which brings me to the second question you asked, which was about monopoly. So a big part of the reason why these companies are becoming monopolies is network economies where I want you to be able to see the picture of my dog that I put up on Facebook. And if we have different platforms, it's going to be more difficult. So we're all going to tend to use the platform that everybody else is using And one of the things that confers this monopoly is having a big inventory of reviews. So I'm worried about that that kind of monopoly. I I don't know. The the barriers to entry of having first the place where everybody goes to look at pictures and second, an inventory of reviews that means that you can't just buy that information very easily sounds like it's going to be a problem. I think the solution is what I would say was your third question about reputation. We are probably looking at a world where instead of me having a reputation on Airbnb that I cannot easily transfer to Uber or to Blah Blah Car, what we could have is a single universal reputation. And again, it's going to be a blockchain app, so it can't be very easily counterfeited. And so you'll be able to tell whether I'm the sort of person that has the quality. I haven't cheated on things. You can look at my credit report. Now, that's a big problem for privacy, but that ship has sailed. We've already lost Mm -hmm. any claim that we had about privacy. And, you know, if you don't want to participate, you can already do that. You can unplug off of Facebook. You're not on Twitter. You don't use Amazon. You don't get any of the ads you don't want to see. That's a really high-cost way of doing it. But if you are plugged in and take advantage of this universal reputation, then if I I want to check, I can just go to this nonprofit company that operates a reputation app that's based on the blockchain, and then the monopoly doesn't exist anymore because it's it's something that's easily publicly available. And we would all be willing to contribute something to that voluntarily in order not to have companies be in charge of our private information. All we would have is some sort of summary information about trustworthiness, 
debt, willingness to pay. I don't know what the actual categories are, but I, I think there's a way around this that combines a blockchain application with universal reputation and the ability of nonprofits to solve this problem if you can reduce the transactions cost of participation and make it clear who's given the contribution so that I can claim credit for it. So that if, if, I, if my standing in the community is raised because you can look and say, well, look, they've really done a lot of good things. They provided a lot of public goods. I'm willing to participate more because I care about being lovely. Yeah, I was thinking, I think that's the name of the app, by the way. That, that's what we're going to call it, lovely.com. I don't know if it's taken already. Maybe it's Be Lovely. I always like Be Lovely as a yeah, motto. Yeah, Be Lovely, yes. Um, and it could be the letter B, if Be Lovely.com, B-E is already taken. But I, I was just thinking, there's something really deep there. Um, if I were 25 years old, I think I would be interested in trying to work on it, but I'm not 25. So I'm hoping there's a 25 or 30 or 40-year-old younger than – somebody younger than I am with a little more – ambition and drive to work on it and talent, of course. But the issue of um, lo- – I would call it the, you know, my loveliness quotient. So I do a number of lovely things during the year. I know you do. Every human being does, right? I'm not, I'm not bragging here. Every human being does lovely things. They open the door for somebody who's got too many groceries. They make a donation to charity. They help out somebody who's um, struggling – Emotionally, and most of these things are only observed by a very small circle around us, right? Our circle of, of immediate friends, and it's an interesting idea of whether of of accumulating. Well, I guess the word is agglomerating of collected. Horrible word, ugly word, but a, a way of collecting my reputational success. The things I've done, and maybe that would ruin it. Of course, if if I bra- if it became publicly known, but the idea of that that across different. I'll give you just a small example. A friend of mine, he rides. Uh, he does a, a bike ride for a hospital in Israel that helps uh, a couple of friends of mine do this. It's called the Alin Hospital, A-L-Y-N. It helps kids. It's an extraordinary hospital. Uh, and I give money to that, right? Now, I'm not going to tell you how much I give because that's neither here nor there, but I give some amount. And I can choose to make that public on the website, and I choose to make it public because I think it's helpful to encourage other people to give. But I could choose to make it anonymous if I wanted. Most people, A lot of people do it anonymously. A lot of people do it publicly. But let's say I do another different thing I gave money to this year, which which I've done, and you don't know – the people on the hospital website don't know about that other one. And would it be a good thing if, if all the, quote, good deeds I did during the year were collected in one place so you could decide how lovely I was? There's something repellent about that, I have to say. But on the other hand, maybe it's not so repellent. Maybe it's kind of a – there's something beautiful about it. It's sort of the modern way that people gossip about – you know, in, in a small town, people say, oh, he, he's a great guy or he's not a good guy. And in in the modern world, we could make that available more widely. And maybe that would make people more likely to trust me to, you know, in my reviews or whatever. I just – that world's coming. Someone's going to develop that, I think, and it will change the world. And in some ways, it's already here where – you. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. There are some things you could do anonymously and some things that you would do and be part of your reputation. But on Uber, I have a reputation as a writer. I can look at it. I yeah, can look you can at see your own. my scores. Yeah. And on Airbnb, uh, I've been a host sometimes. My son, Kevin, has often been a host and for a while had a little bit of trouble with <laughs> some of his hosting. He needed needed some work on that. But so you, you're getting feedback. But – if you get feedback and you get better, then there's a reward like any brand name. So yep. the the reason why I think this is going to take off and why the blockchain is important is that you are acting on your own behalf in a sharing economy, some of which is for profit, some of which is not. And what that means is you're basically your own your own brand. So I can look up on LinkedIn what your skills are, and maybe LinkedIn or some program like it will connect to my reputation, and I'll I'll try to curate my reputation. Uh, Maybe there's some things that are I'll I'll keep anonymous because I think that I would be it would be wrong for me to trade on on that as part of my reputation score. But I think a lot of people think of this as kind of a, a video game. It might change the nature of what was an altruistic or charitable impulse into something that's now instrumental. But it, the fact remains that your reputation would then condition the extent to which you're willing to act badly. And that's that has been 
what the desire to be lovely has always meant is I care more than I should if I were homo economicus about the opinions of those around me. It's not just instrumental. I care about them because I value, primitively value, the opinion of other people about me, not because it gets me something, but because I care about that. Yeah, having think, having spoken about it now and thought about it for about four minutes, I guess I'm kind of uncomfortable, the idea that you know, when I was younger, I was in a business school at Washington University, a fine institution, which I think you a fine institution have a high regard for. Um, I think that's where that conversation with Doug North took place in your PhD defense. It may have. It did. Um, I remember being in a business school and thinking oh, – we had a speaker come in and said, you know, you have a brand. Your brand is your performance, your reliability, your et cetera. And there's something um, – that's not a bad thing for a young person to be aware of. At the same time, again, it's a little weird for a hardcore free marker to say, I really don't like the idea of turning my charitable altruistic activities into something instrumental as you described it. It comes back to this idea of, uh, I mentioned in the past about Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He talks about the difference between a covenant and a contract. Contract, it's it's a, a contract's about what's in it for me. A covenant is about a commitment that doesn't necessarily use cost benefit analysis. And I'm not sure I want to mingle those. And, and that's the idea that I mentioned of having a reputation, a charitable reputational uh, score or some kind of uh, reputation in general for being a decent person, and 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 reducing it to a number or reducing it to a, a web page. Uh, there's something I find a little bit creepy about it, I have to say. It might – I think it would lead to a lot – maybe it would lead to more charitable giving. I don't know. And as an alternative way to generate public goods, which is where we got started on this, uh, I think there's something really potentially uh, magnificent about that as a way to reduce the transaction costs of government. The tra transaction costs of government are the tax system, compliance, monitoring, uh, dead weight loss from those you know, those prices that we pay, the distortions – and to be able to do that through some kind of sharing or app, maybe it wouldn't be true for national defense, but it could be true very much so at the local level for schools, say, in bad neighborhoods that struggle to generate enough money to pay for them. And that we could – those of us who are lucky enough to do well could help contribute to that in an easy, effortless, low-cost way. That's a glorious thing. I'm not sure I want to go far as far as the transact is the reputational score thing. No, I'm just – that's I'm making me a little nervous. I, I think you have identified both sides of the argument. <clears throat> My Duke colleague, uh, Jeffrey Brennan, has a favorite joke, and it goes like this. Two elderly gentlemen are sitting in a park in the sun, and one turns to the other and says, I say, how is your wife? And the other one thinks for a moment and says, well, com compared to what? <laughs> well, the the problem of the public goods is we're comparing this to a system where we have very little information and where local public goods decisions are made coercively. So we don't have much information and we're taking tax money basically at gunpoint. The alternative would be what is it that people really care about and they get the sense of participation. So the having local public goods be provided voluntarily by the things that people actually care the things that people actually care about, and have them be crowdsourced, well, compared to what? Compared to the existing system, that might very well be an improvement, and it might increase people's sense of participation and belonging. The overall reputation score, the problem is economic revolutions don't care what we think about them. <laughs> I agree with you. It's not good. But you already, if you participate in this economy, if you're a young person, you already, you already have a reputation on LinkedIn – on Airbnb, on Uber, on Yelp, if you operate any sort of business where you're trying to sell stuff, you really need to solve this problem of ha not having a reputation. And not having a reputation is an entry barrier in this kind of economy. So yes, maybe you don't want it to be instrumental, but compared to what? The alternative is not to be able to participate at all, and it's like the Industrial Revolution. The commodification of labor was in many ways bad for people who lived in villages who found that, you know, I need a source of money income or I can't acquire the things that I need. They had to go get a job. Economic revolutions don't care what we think about them. Was the Industrial Revolution good? Maybe not. Maybe not at first. 
The ultimate result, though, was we found ways to manage it that improved the wealth most of those who had been very poor. So I guess I'm optimistic that we'll solve this reputation problem, though I don't deny for a moment that there is something really repulsive about the idea of, of changing these relationships that we have that are based on a deep sort of human trust in to a trust that's being manufactured through some algorithm. That's a different thing, and it's not good. My guest today has been Michael Munger. His book is Tomorrow 3.0, Transaction Costs and the Sharing Economy. Mike, thanks for being part of EconTalk. It was great to talk to you, Russ. Thanks. This is EconTalk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more EconTalk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.